Hey everybody, Craig Rochelle here, and I'm so excited about what you're going to experience in the next few weeks. You're going to get to hear the story about one of the most amazing families in the history of the world, and that may sound like an overstatement, but I think once you hear this story, um, you're going to agree that this is truly one of the most amazing stories in the history of the world. You're going to hear from Steve Saint, an awesome and fully devoted follower of Christ, and he's going to help all of us to see what it means to be a part of God's family. We're going to learn not just how do we grow closer to God, but how do we extend an invitation to others through the way we live to become fully devoted followers of Christ as well. I know this is going to speak to you. This is something you may want to invite uh, other friends and family members to hear. In the next few weeks, I know Steve Saint's story is going to minister to you in a profound way. So here's Steve Saint and Beyond the Gates of Splendor. family has a story. How my family became part of a Stone Age Amazon tribe is a story that began before I was born and is still being written today. In the Bible, in Acts 2, verse 23, it says that God himself planned the death of his only son. And it wasn't something that Jesus wanted to do either. But it was God's plan, and Jesus was willing. Yesterday, the voice of the Andes was notified via shortwave messages through the Ecuador Jungle Radio Network that five missionaries who were making a survey in dangerous Indian territory had been out of radio contact with their base for over 24 hours. It was reported that the Missionary Aviation Fellowship plane that flew them in had uh, been spotted from the air on a river bank or the beach of a small island in the river. And Sunday, it, it, Pete, his last words, I believe, were, pray girls. I don't know why he called us girls, but we were younger then. Pray girls, I'm sure this is the day. And it was the day. That night, I had a dream. I saw the plane, and I saw the bodies around the plane. And I, I just woke up and just in great fear. I didn't hear Dad when Mom called for him on the radio. He did not respond, and I had never heard that before. 
And uh, the next thing I knew, Mom was asking me to run to the next door neighbors. He was an, a pilot that flew with Dad, and she wanted me to ask his wife if she could get Dad on the radio. And I thought that was very strange. And then on, on the Sunday night that uh, Roger was supposed to, to come out and spend the night with us, um, he never did. Bethy was not quite four years old, but she had a special dress that she'd brought with her to Artahuno, and they got dressed up. And they went out to the airstrip expecting the plane about the same time they'd usually come, which would be before dark. We went down to the, to the strip, Beth and Jerry and I, and we waited and waited, and, and uh, there was just no, no plane that came in. I wanted to grow up to be just like my dad. And then one day, a lot of people started coming over to our house. But I was busy keeping the frogs out of the well and making sure that there were no snakes in the generator shed and important stuff like that. And I was waiting for my dad to come back. Dad had flown into the jungle a few days before, just like he usually did carrying medicines, you know, and flying people back to their jungle homes if they had come out for medical attention. Only this time, Dad didn't come back like he usually did. Now, it's hard for boys to keep precise track of time, so I wasn't too worried, except for all the people at the house. I knew something big was going on, and I figured Dad should be home to help handle things. Then about the third or fourth day that Dad had been gone, my mom called me into the house and took me into hers and Dad's room. That meant that I was in trouble or something big was happening. I was totally unprepared for what was about to happen to me and to my life. I went back to the beach and uh, we flew downstream and saw uh, four of the bodies. And I took pictures uh, of each body uh, as best I could. We didn't know who it was, but they tied a rope on it and then they found another one. And they pulled them and they laid them on the beach there. We didn't know who they were. They weren't in too good shape. So, Dr. Johnston, he started to go over their bodies. He uh, measured them, found that one of them was taller than the other one. And uh, so we came to the conclusion that one of them was Jim Elliott, and the other one was Peter Fleming. The helicopter said, now there's a body down below here. But when I got so close, I could see it was Nate. We pulled up. Long side. I could see he had a spear right here in his head. And he had a cut in his face with a machete right here. I could see that. One thing I noticed. His wristwatch was not here, but it was clear up here. But he always did that. Whenever he wanted to remember something, he'd pull his wristwatch up here. I knew that. But anyway, I was supposed to tie a rope on him. I couldn't do it. I tried. Couldn't do it. So the the missionary that was with me, he saw I was having trouble. So he said, "I'll do it." He tied him. We pulled him. My pilot is gone. Felt so badly, terrible. 
but hey, you can't feel this way now. Get going. You got to get out of here. Get these people. Do what you can and leave. Can't sit here and cry. So we did. Brought him up to the beach. There was Jim. There was Pete. There was Nate. I, that just couldn't be. What about all of Dad's and my plans, learning to fix and fly his plane, old 5'6 Henry? And who would teach me to swim so that I could go into the jungles with Dad? And who would play train with me and tell Kathy and Phil and me stories at night after devotions? I was devastated. I thought that life was over. No more hope, nothing to look forward to ever again. Life does that to people you know. You know that as well as I do. You might be feeling that way right now. But life is a story and it doesn't end in the first chapter. I know that now, but I didn't back then. I also had no way of knowing that hard chapters in life are the chapters that most definitely impact our lives. But that doesn't mean that they don't hurt, does it? Now, as I talked to the wives afterwards, I felt so bad that I couldn't bring their husbands back to home. But as I talked to them, I could feel that they were in this thing just as much as the men were. I wrote to my, my parents and Roger's parents, but long before our letter got there, they had heard it over the radio. And my mom had written me back shortly after she heard. And she had told me that uh, if I wanted to come home, that she and daddy would, would help take care of the children. I thought that was a good idea at first. Long before that, I had given my heart to the Lord to be a missionary, so as a missionary, I had to stay. We were helping her close up the house. I mean, that was very hard on her because I think she really believed that Ed was going to come out of the jungles, and she wanted to be there for him. I get letters from people still from time to time with gifts saying, you know, we, we pray for you, we still pray for you, we still pray for your family. Trust the, trust you're doing well. Now we've all heard about New Testament Christians being fed to hungry lions and being used as entertainment and gladiator contests who accepted their fate through faith. Well, I watched five widows accept the sudden and unexpected death of their husbands, the fathers of their children, of which I'm one, with that very same confident trust that God had a plan and that he would someday make sense of their excruciating pain and loss. My mom kept on praying for the very warriors who had just brutally killed my dad. These five women's willingness to accept God's will and to go on living for Christ has deeply impacted my life and the, and the lives of hundreds of thousands of other people. Aunt Betty, Jim's widow, and my Aunt Rachel actually went in and lived with those people who killed our fathers and husbands. Two Quechua men appeared at the door right about 12 o'clock, and they said, we've got two Alka women at our house. Do you want to see them? And of course I said yes, instantly. And so I threw a couple of things into a carrying bag and, and I set off down the trail. Here are these two girls and nobody could understand a word they were saying. I said, here, you get in here and we're gonna go back to my house. The time came when they both came to me and they said, when that palm fruit is ripe, we're going home and we want you to come with us. And I said, well, do you think your people will spear me the way they speared my husband? And they put their arms around me and they laughed and they said, of course not, you're our friend. I sort of remember being carried in a wooden chair 
on the back of one of the Kichwa Indians, bumping along, my head bumping back against it and falling asleep on it. Then they gave me the name Nemo, which was one of Dayuma's sisters. She was macheted to death when they were wiping out Dayuma's whole family. And so I took Nemo's place in the kinship and then had the protection of Dayuma's family. But also, I soon found out the enmity of her enemies. And Dayuma gave me a full course in Alka fleeing technique. Every now and then, they would ask me if I wanted to go with them on their trips into the jungles. And on one occasion, I saw what looked to me like a perfectly good trail going off to the right. And I said, uh, when do you go down here? And they looked at me and they said, we don't go down there. I said, why not? Well, this, those guys are killers down there. I said, well, you're killers. You, you've been killing people for all these years. And they would laugh over that, you know. Yeah, well, we've, we've killed people too, but those guys are real killers. I was regularly receiving letters from both Jim Elliott's parents and my parents, and they would always be cautioning me they were not at all happy with the idea that I was living in a prim primitive tribe with a bunch of naked alkas, and here was this precious little girl that belonged to them. Dayuma, of course, was the preacher. And Dayuma, every Sunday, would corral everybody, you know, and tell them, you know, this is Sunday, this is God's day, so you have to come and, and I'm going to teach you the Bible, which she did. In the meantime, Rachel, during the week, would be teaching Dayuma. Mom made another visit, this time with Marilu McCulley. They were greeted by the very same people who had speared Dad and his friends, but who now expressed regret. And the word, the word in Warani for believing or actually for hearing, understanding, obeying, and several other concepts like that is inya. And so they use the one word and it, and it glosses a whole bunch of things. To hear means, in that sense, to truly take it in. Not just to hear, but also to understand and assimilate. The Wadani were able in, over, in, in a period of just a few years to uh, reduce the, the homicide rate by well over 90%. Nothing else changed. The ecological situation hadn't changed. There were, they had no new techniques, no new tools available to them. There was certainly no biological change. What changed was the information that people had available to them. And on the basis of that, they made a radical transformation in their, in their social life. Uh, this pattern of vendettas that we've been able to document f goes back at least five generations, disappeared like that. I have obviously lived a long time since Dad Nate was speared to death with his friends, Uncle Jim, Uncle Roger, Uncle Ed, and Uncle Pete. People ask me all the time how I ever got over hating the jungle warriors who killed Dad. Now, I don't want to shock you. It never occurred to me. And I realized that God didn't let Dad die. Nope. I have come to the conclusion that God planned my dad's death. Now, if that offends you, remember, he was my dad. And I know those men who drove spears into my dad's body and hacked him with machetes. I've eaten with them, I've slept in the same hut with them, I've gone hunting with them, I've listened to their killing stories. In fact, in the old days, killing was like a sport to them. You killed and lived, or you were killed and died. I've also come to know the God 
that Dad, Roger, Pete, Ed, and Jim were trying to serve when they were so brutally killed. And I'm convinced that there's no way that six jungle warriors with spears would have attacked five foreigners with guns under normal circumstances. And the chances of them actually killing all five is incredibly small. I mean, you know, the guys had a tree house. One of them could have been up there, or they, they shot their guns in the air, which usually ended while on the attacks. Or Dad could have started the airplane engine, or he might have been out flying. And then the story would have been totally different. No, I think that the only way that this part of the story could have ended the way it did is if God orchestrated it to be just exactly the way it turned out. In the Bible, in Acts 2, verse 23, it says that God himself planned the death of his only son. And it wasn't something that Jesus wanted to do either. But it was God's plan, and Jesus was willing. And so was my dad, and so were Jim, Ed, Pete, and Roger. I know what I'm saying doesn't fit with most people's idea of being a Christian, but I'm telling you that being a Christ follower is an extreme call to a radical life following a revolutionary leader. So many people seem to talk about sacrifice and suffering when they talk about being a God follower. But wait a minute, is it really a sacrifice to follow God? Sure, we have to give up some of the things and we have to be obedient to God's principles for living and we can't take revenge on people that hurt us. But most of those things that we supposedly give up make our lives more wholesome and more fun and keep us healthier physically and emotionally and spiritually. Listen, I've hired people to do some really nasty jobs. And for that matter, I've done some really nasty jobs myself. Why didn't we talk about those as sacrifice? Because God promises everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake, he says, will receive a hundred times as much in return. And then we get a bonus besides eternal life. When we give up something here for something much bigger in eternity, that isn't sacrifice, that's investment. The question is, do we really believe in eternity? And you know what the secret to really believing in eternity is? It's making regular big investments in eternity while we're here. When I was in high school in the States, I decided that I wanted to be baptized. And I wanted the people that baptized me to be people that had had a significant role in my life and in my spiritual development. I was in the same water where Dad's body had been thrown, and at either side of me were the two men that in their youth had killed Dad. And, and all I knew was that I really loved these two guys. Now, I'm telling you, I know for sure that I wasn't asked to come speak to you because my father played it safe. And it isn't because I've been spared life's pain that I have something to give you that can make hope take root in your life. Nope. When life beats us up and we're bloodied and bruised, we want someone that can understand what we're going through. When that man or woman tells us that there's still hope, we believe them. Hebrews 2.10 says that God prepared Christ to be our Savior through suffering. He has scars. Jesus has scars where we have wounds. Now, let me ask you a question. Who's writing your story? This might seem trite, but life is a story. And the most important decision in life is who is going to author our story. If you do it, there will be pain, and I've lived long enough to tell you with absolute certainty that it's not going to turn out the way that you think it will. Now, on the other hand, if you let God write your story, well, it won't turn out the way you hope it will either. 
God doesn't promise that all the chapters will be easy, but what he does promise is that in the last chapter, if not before, he's going to make sense of all the rest of the story. I remember meeting Minkai the first week we were down there. And I remember this, this older Waodani guy who would walk by my hammock. For some reason, he would laugh a lot of the time. I love joking around, so I started uh, poking at him through my mosquito net. I remember trying to get Minkai to be quiet, and I would go, shh, Minkai, shh. And he would just look at me and say, like that. Usually we would do that to his wife. We would get her attention and then do that to her and she would just scold us. Minkai is one of the men who who killed my grandfather and his four friends. Sometimes I will call him Mame, which means grandfather. He can't be a replacement, but he can be a grandfather to me. When it was time for Jesse to leave to go back to work the summer before starting college, Jesse and Minkai were standing over just a little ways away and they had their hands on each other's shoulders and both of them were crying. I'd never seen a wild honey man cry. We uh, we did this a couple times, and finally I got in the plane, and it was I was still sobbing when I got into shell. Jesse came to me and said, "Hey, Pop, there's just one thing I'd like for graduation. I'd really like for you to bring Grandfather Minkai up here to see me graduate." And it was really special to have Minkai here for my graduation. He was there uh, in the stands as I walked up and got my diploma. Minkai got to come to the States, and that has started these visits. He tried so hard to master bathrooms. You know, he went in to take a shower one night. Nothing happened, and nothing happened. So I went in to see what was happening, and Minkai was standing in the shower but instead of there being two faucets, there was only one. So he was just trying to think this thing through. Well, the next house we went to, he went in the bathroom, nothing happened, I went in. And this time he had this one faucet and, and he was turning it back and forth and nothing was happening because that one you had to pull out first. But then we went to this one house and Minkai went into the bathroom and I heard the, the water come on and I thought, Finally, you know, finally Minkai can run his own shower. But then I start hearing this banging, just, I mean, it sounded like he was tearing the bathroom apart. So I pulled back the shower curtain and there was Minkai all curled up down in the bathtub. And uh, he looked up at me and he said, Bob, Ed, the foreigners all being fat, how do they get under this little thing? <laughs> he said, some of the foreigners are so nice that even when you're, when you're driving, you just stop by their houses and and you go to one of the one of the openings in their walls and he said they just open it for you and and then they start giving you food and it's already hot and it's already cooked and stuff he said i see those foreigners very very well when minkai came back from the states the first time he told the people that the foreigners are really big and fat because even when they go walking they don't move their feet they just get on the trail and the trail moves well, Ompore, his wife said, oh, you're talking wild. Minkai just kept saying, that's why all the foreigners are fat. They don't walk, they don't climb, they don't make gardens. But when they got to that one, Ompore just, she just said, well, how are they gonna live then? Minkai said, they have these big food houses. And he said, there's just piles of food. First, there's these young people, and they're standing at the place where you go out, and you smile as big as you can. And he said, they pretend like they're not seeing you. And then he said, then after a little while, then they look at you and they smile. And he said, when they smile, boom, 
you can just go and take all the food with you. And I said, well, it's, it's kind of like that. So I just took out my credit card and I said, first you have to give them something like this. And Minkai looked at all of them, he smiled and he said, they just give it right back to you. Here's the deal. When we give up something and get something better or bigger or more satisfying in return, or even if we just hope to get something bigger or better, well, that's considered an investment, not a sacrifice. God looks for common, ordinary people like you and me who are willing to let Him use us as He sees fit. He wants to write our story. He doesn't want to be our editor, but we want to write the story, and then we call God in as our editor when the story gets messy. Then we want to turn it over to God so that He can clean up the mess, but then we grab the pen back again. You know what God wants from you? He just wants you. He wants you to acknowledge Him as your Father, and He wants you to tell others how to come.